Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. That was a very thorough introduction, so I can skip most of this slide. <laughs> these, are, these are just some background points. I thought I'd start off by giving you some background on myself. Uh, I want to start first by saying thank you to a number of people and organizations who made this possible. Uh, my first and sincere thanks go out to Father James Woods. He's the dean of the Advancing Studies College at Boston College, and he is the individual that made the early work in immersive education possible by allowing it to be used. We're using video games to teach classes instead of coming onto campus. We talked to the university and said perhaps we can have the students come to class remotely in a video game, not even a standard virtual reality environment. So to Father James Woods, I'd like to say thank you. And to the immersive education community, a lot of the examples, in fact, every one of the examples that I'll show you today is based on uh, our community, which has thousands of members worldwide. Uh, there are a number of chapters that I'll speak about, technology working groups and community groups. All of these are responsible for the materials I'm going to show you today. And of course, I'd like to say thank you to the conference committee for making it possible for me to come and speak today, and to Christopher and Ivan uh, especially for making it possible for me to come share, and for Barbara Mikulojak, who in Boston helped to coordinate uh, my trip here. So here's actually the slide I said I would skip, and I'm going to go ahead and skip that. It's the major bullet points um, of my background. My background now extends over 20 years in virtual reality and uh, VR, power glove type of technologies, where we used to use the head-mounted displays and put on a glove and walk around, and we thought this is the way everything is going to be, and it's just not done still today for a number of reasons. Uh, that was way back, it's hard to believe, in the 80s and 90s, and most of my work is centered around, oops, pardon me, is centered around uh, international standards in the Web3D community and the MPEG group, so MPEG4, MPEG2, MPEG1, there's a 3D, interactive 3D component to that that I was involved with as well. Uh, I started teaching at Advancing Studies in Boston College in 1999, and just a few years into that began using these immersive technologies to take the students and myself off of campus in an immersive collaborative environments so that we could learn without having to be together on campus. Most of what I did on campus was what I'm doing now. I would sit and I would talk. Oops, pardon me. And I would occasionally drop things to wake the students up. And increasingly, this is what was happening in class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you'd have, I was contending with this technology in class. One of the remedies to that was to take the students outside of this environment that was very hard for a young man or a young woman to pay attention in, take them into a very engaging environment where they didn't have time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They didn't have time to do that. They had to be present. They had to be active and they had to be engaged. And I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, following on that, around the same time, I co- uh, or rather founded a series on Core Web 3D. The idea was that immersive technology was coming to the internet, and now it's actually here. Uh, but most importantly, for the purposes of my trip here today, started in 2003. After all of my work in 3D and all of my work in virtual reality, there was no organization that was focused on bringing this into education and training. And based on my prior work in international standards, that's when the Immersive Education Initiative and the Media Grid, which is an organization that supports it technologically, uh, began. If you want that extenuous uh, biography that was written, you're welcome to see it. I think it'll bore you to death, but you can contact me and also get more background from me at immersiveeducation.org. I'm going to skip one of the virtual reality uh, environments that we use for teaching called Virtual Egypt, and if you're in the master class tomorrow, I'll show you some of that. A lot of what I'll be showing you comes from the Immersive Education Charter, which is available online. Uh, there's the direct link, but you can always just go to immersiveeducation.org and look for charter. So if you want to get access to this in the course, the slides will be available afterwards as well. A, a lot of the material comes directly from our charter. So I'll start by giving you an overview. I'll drive on down through how the organization works. And probably what most people are interested in is the examples part. And that's... That's where I'll spend about half of my time to really show you what this technology is and how it's being used. The first question that people ask me is, why would you do this? Why would you have a position at Boston College? Why would you be in a faculty role? And then why would you take yourself and your students out of class 
why would you take that risk? Why would you put yourself in that situation? Why would you expect the students to do it? And, and quite honestly, it's a very simple answer for me. I believe that I was losing students and it got to a point for me that I wasn't enjoying being in the classroom as much as I could. And I felt that there was some radical change that could occur in education if we could use all these technologies that I was involved with and apply them to the education experience. And my feeling at the time, and still today, is that we can change our lives if we change the way we learn. Education is incredibly important, and nobody disagrees with that. However, we lose a lot of people in the process of formal education in the United States and other countries. It's almost a crisis. In some cases, I think it could be argued that it is a crisis. So if we can change the way that we teach if we can change the way that people learn so that they are fully engaged, excited, and have richer learning experiences that are more meaningful, we can change lives. As a formal introduction to the Immersive Education Initiative, the work started in 2005 as a nonprofit open organization free to join for anybody involved in education or nonprofit organizations. It's a collaboration of universities, colleges, research institutes, museums, consortias, and companies that are all working together to apply immersive technologies to education and training. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, today, there are thousands of members worldwide with chapters around the world, and the chapters continue to grow. I'll talk a bit about that. But the real nugget here is that the combined membership of all of the members who come together to work on these technologies and bring them back to the classroom reach millions of students around the world. Members have early access to technology and they also get to influence the technology. So the members come together into what we call technology working groups and they actually influence the direction of the technology for others to use. As I mem mentioned, membership has always been open and free, but it was always restricted, initially always restricted, to nonprofit organizations and those who had extensive experience. So when we opened Immersive Education, we had about 300 members from around the world who had been working in virtual environments, synthetic environments, virtual reality for education. And that number kept growing and growing until we were in the thousands of members. And it remained open and it remained uh, free, but it still was restricted. You had to go through an application process and show your credentials in order to get involved. And that was because we were at the early stages of trying to get our arms around how to use this technology in the classroom. That real hard work has been done. The organization is now open for anybody to join. And earlier this year at our Immersive Education 2012 conference in Boston, I had 2012, we announced corporate memberships as well. Historically, corporations haven't been allowed to participate. It's been a pure academic educational environment. But we are now opening up to uh, corporate environments as well. This is especially important and was especially important in the early stages and it, it is today in a lot of my conversation in the first 15 to 20 minutes of the master class tomorrow will be about how to choose a virtual learning environment, a virtual world in particular. It comes down in many cases to the intellectual property. What do you own when you construct things in these environments and can you take them wherever you want to? Early, early on, we had a mandate that said it had to be open. If you were going to be using these technologies in the classroom, you had to have 100% ownership and access to those technologies. You couldn't be reliant on a company, for example, who might close it down, and that happened a lot. A lot of the early virtual worlds and synthetic learning environments shut down. They're just very hard to keep funded. You had no opportunity to take the technology out and you'd build entire classrooms on it and be basically lost. And so we spent a lot of time saying it had to be open and all the work we did was in the open community. And we had a number, you can see seven different points of openness there. What is required to be open? Now, a major change has happened along with uh, opening up to corporate and entities who want to participate in immersive education. Again, in 2012, this year, down at the IAD 2012 conference, we announced that we would still continue to support all of our open mandates, but also allow for a commercial technology. This is simply a reflection of the environment that we are living in. Early when we started, we wanted to get a good solid rooting for educators to use the technology, but increasingly there's a lot of wonderful and, and sometimes superior technology being produced by companies that are strong and robust, and we need to be able to support that and make it available to our community. So we started for the first time to accept commercial technology as well and teach the educators to choose which one do you choose and why just to help educate them 
So there's this notion of the technology platforms, the immersive education technology platforms. I know that at this conference we're focused on item number three primarily, which is video games and learning games, but immersive education is a very large collection of technologies. And I'll give you some demonstrations in just a moment. First, the ones that most educators flocked to in the early years were called virtual worlds. And just as a show of hands, how many people are comfortable with the, the term virtual world? Have you been in a virtual world before? I w at this conference, I would hope and expect, so if not, tomorrow the Master Workshop's a good chance to get your hands on, on them and start building and constructing them. Uh, the next is a simulation, a virtual simulation, which is, could be, a virtual world that actually is applied to a very specific scenario. We then have learning games and uh, video games, commercial off-the-shelf video games that we also use for teaching and training. Augmented and mixed reality, full immersive virtual reality, that's the the, the headsets that I talked about that almost nobody uses uh, for a number of reasons. And if you're curious, we can talk afterwards why that market hasn't taken off quite yet. A lot of it has to do with people throwing up. Uh, you wear those things for too long, you get a severe eye strain and you get nauseous and disoriented. Uh, part of the problem has to do with the fact that you're focused on a lens that's right in front of your eye. And if you make a muscle and hold it for a long time, what happens? It starts to cramp, it starts to hurt, and you have to let go. Well, your eyes are locked into a position for 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes. The muscles on your eyes start to strain, and they start to cause you some anxiety, not anxiety, but some, some uh, muscular issues in your head. Those can cause headaches. They can make you start to feel nauseous. A lot of reasons. But the truth is there are a lot of other fully immersive technologies out as well. Caves and domes, glasses and goggles are starting to become more popular and the natural hands-free interfaces that I'll show you some examples of in a moment. And lastly, we have computational thinking and learning uh, technologies. Most people, when they think of immersive education, think I'm going into a virtual environment, I'm going into a synthetic environment, or I'm going to be playing with three-dimensional augmented or mixed environments. And that's the, what I would say, the traditional way of thinking about immersive education. But there's an entirely new class of what we call computational thinking and learning systems where they could simply be two-dimensional. You're not going into them. But the end user, the student or the learner, is programming or scripting or highly engaged in a technical process that involves lar logic, planning, um, projection, prediction, all these types of skills that we like to see applied to other areas in our lives and in school. Uh, among those technologies that we use are Scratch, Alice, Greenfoot, and even Minecraft. Uh, just a quick heads up, how many people have heard of Minecraft before? All right. That is a breakout success in terms of being able to engage people in the learning process. Most people think of it as a video game, but I'll show a little bit about how we're using it for immersive education. Okay. so. You came here to be immersed, and so far we've been doing two-dimensional slides, much like I do in the classroom where I have a lot of students doing this, checking email, making dates later on at night. So why don't we show some of the technologies. This is just a small slice, and again, my thanks to the immersive education community for these demonstrations. I'll walk through a number of them, and I'll pause and explain what we're seeing as we go along. <coughs> So this very first example that I'm going to show is an immersive field trip. It's built using virtual world technology, and it is an aquarium. And the first school to use this was in Colorado. In, in Colorado, there's a school called South Park, and there's also a TV show called South Park that <laughs> most people know about, and it is a real place. Uh, and also, about 97% of the students are at the poverty level. Uh, they are on government assistance for food, so when they come to the school, they're not buy bringing food from home, and they're not bringing money to pay for food. The government's paying for their food. They don't have access to resources like you might expect uh, folks to have, and the school itself does not have access to resources. There is no aquarium in this city. The furthest one is a couple hours away, and they can't afford bus money to go on to the bus. There's a zoo in the city just about seven to ten minutes away, but they can't afford the bus money to get the kids on the bus to take them to the zoo. So the principal of the school, when she first contacted us, said, you know, we've got a desperate situation. They're dropping out. They're having a hard time. They can't study. They're not engaged, and we want them to see the world around them, but we can't afford to take them there. What can you do? I said, well, we can have a virtual field trip, and this is what they were doing when they went to the aquarium.
So far, they've been trapped inside of an air bubble below ground, but now the children and the teachers have a chance to become one of the fish. In this case, we're going to see a butterfish on the outside. We're going to click on that, the avatar or the person becomes the fish, and now they can go outside and interact with the other fish. So what you saw was a simulation, also a virtual environment that is a virtual field trip. And along the way, through this engagement process, the students are actually learning about the scientific names of the fish and the creatures, so all those tags that were above them. Some of them are people's names when the students come in. They get to give themselves a name, and that floats above their head. A lot of the other objects are the scientific names of the sharks and the butterfish and the other things. So they start to learn them by the scientific names. Now, if you took these same kids and you gave them a list of the scientific names and the pictures of the fish and told them, memorize this, most of them wouldn't do it. However, because they're in playing around, having a fun game in what they feel is a game environment, they start to identify these creatures by their names because that's how they see and that's what they know either I can get close to it or I have to stay away or I should run away from it or I need to feed it. They start to interact in a very meaningful way. They engage, they're busy and they're occupied learning without realizing that they're actually learning. And of course, there are some elements of drama that get introduced along the way, because they're just having a good time so far. Sharks, it keeps them on their toes. And now we're going down into the sea vents to see the creatures in the sea vent area. That was one example of an early immersive education uh, environment. The next one I'll show you is completely different using a completely different virtual world technology. This one is for students with Let's autism. Quickly choose our personal goal. It's not a video game, but it looks like one. You guys have a couple to choose from. Families were coming back saying, wow, what are you doing? Teachers that weren't sure what we were doing, just knew that kid was doing something, were coming to us and saying, can we have whatever you're doing because we're seeing changes at school. College of Education faculty have developed curricula that uses a virtual world experience, like a video game, or uh, the upcoming lesson, which is in a castle, so just to help students with autism spectrum disorder learn social competency. It's called iSocial. One of the things that the technology does, it allows us to bring the social experience to them in a little different way. So it's, it can be uh, brought to them in steps. The curricula help kids build skills like idea sharing, turn taking, and facial expression recognition. So for children with autism, so this just isn't your typical student, this is a student with great number of challenges. One of them is just being able to read people. When I look at someone and they're smiling, I understand their state of mind. A, a child with autism doesn't know how to read faces. They don't understand this. How do you take a child like that and teach them? how to interact with other students in the classroom, let alone in the world outside. That's what this particular virtual world is used for, is teaching students with autism. There are five units comprised of six lessons each. The technology allows us to really craft the learning activity to the individual needs of the kids. And that statement sums up a lot of what immersive education gives to educators. It allows them to customize and tailor the learning experience to individual children. One of the issues we've had for a long time uh, with education, especially in the United States, is classrooms full of people and everybody being taught the same way, exactly the same style. And if that's not how you learn, if that's not the best way for you to learn, you can struggle mightily. In the immersive environments, you can have personalized, constructed environments that appeal to the way you learn. So we'll step on to another example. And this is simply an example of an environment of a Japanese house that was built with the Boston Children's Museum. And they have an exhibit where people have to come and see the Japanese house. It actually came from Japan many, many years ago. But if you're not on the museum's territory, if you're not there, you can't see it. In this example, a virtual world was constructed to allow people to virtually tour this exhibit in the museum and also once they say we're at the actual museum they can go home and relive the experience and this is using a combination of photographs and virtual world technology 
so that the museum staff can actually take people on tours of the same virtual environment or the same place but virtually. Here we just have one person touring it, but you can meet there and talk to them and point out different things for cultural heritage. And here we have one of my favorite examples because everybody's moving so fast. These are all of my students on caffeine. I've had too much coffee, and I'm going to speed it up even more. Here's an example of applied building and construction. The floor plan was created in a two-dimensional floor plan program, and it was laid down on a virtual environment, and the students have to work together to construct this architectural uh, environment. This is a home. Now what they have to do is know all the different pieces of a house. They have to know how they fit together. They have to coordinate. You see them typing to each other and talking. And as an educator, I can see who built what. I get an inventory of who constructed the sink, who built the floor, who put in the door frames. I can see exactly what each student did. And they have to coordinate together, collaborate in a way that they wouldn't be able to do in the real world. We can't take students out and have them do this in a semester, but they can do it in one or two hours together in an immersive education environment. And there's the finished product. So this is all examples of virtual worlds. Now we're going to show virtual worlds used for simulation. In this case, we're going to show EcoMove. EcoMove is an exciting new curriculum research project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education that uses immersive to teach that middle that school students about ecosystems and causal patterns. It includes two computer-based modules, Pond and Forest, within a four-week inquiry-based ecosystems curriculum. Here we are in the pond module. We can walk around the pond and see all the different plants and animals, like these ducks. The camera tool lets us take pictures, and saving the photo displays a virtual field guide with information about each of the organisms we find. We can also walk under the water to see the species living there. And using a virtual microsubmarine, we can shrink down and see the microscopic life in the pond at different levels of magnification. The environment around the pond includes features like a golf course, roads, and houses. Following this runoff pipe leads us to a drainage ditch near a new housing development where we meet a landscaper putting down fertilizer. Throughout the environment, on different days, we meet virtual characters like Manny, who may provide useful information. Back at the pond, the water measurement tools let us take various measurements of the water in the pond, such as phosphates and turbidity. Students can collect weather and population data as well. The calendar tool lets us travel through time in order to see how the pond has changed on different days. Here, it's raining. When we walk under the water, we can see how cloudy the water is the turbidity is higher, and we can also take another measurement. The data view lets us see and compare data we've collected. The atom tracker tool lets us see what happens to atoms in the ecosystem over time. I'm going to pause it for a moment. This is a really important point. So this is a project from Harvard University who's presented at Immersive Education and has been members for years and they've reached a stage where this is being used quite a bit now by students. And the important point that we're going to see here is something called an atom tracker. Most of what I've shown you so far are real world reconstructions in the virtual world. But how do you teach something like oxygen in photosynthesis, things that you really cannot see? In this case, here's an example of using the virtual environment to model and simulate the molecules of air that are around us every day that we can't see. And it's one of the powers of immersive learning technologies is you can visualize and model things that human beings actually cannot see or understand, or to observe things in a very compressed time frame. 
you know, here we have a calendar that lets us see what happens with rainflow and turbidity in the water and pollution over many, many years just by changing the amount of time that we want to see on the calendar. If you had to actually show somebody that in real time, you'd say, okay, we're going to start studying a pond ecosystem and you're going to sit here for five years and when you come back, I want to see your notebook. This is going to be a lot of work. Here you can compress time. We can find and track three atoms, carbon, phosphorus, and oxygen. On each simulated day, we can find the atom tracker signs and read a description of what has happened to each atom since our last visit. Here we see an oxygen atom that is part of a water molecule in the leaf of a tree. And then on our next visit, we see that through photosynthesis, the oxygen atom is being released into the air as part of an O2 molecule. As students explore different days at the pond, they discover that on July 28th, all the large fish in the pond are dead. Boom, here's the game. So up until this point, you could consider it simply a simulation, a virtual world that is simulating a pond environment. But now there's a game. We're engaging the student at this point with the mystery. Every kid that's, that comes upon the dead fish is, <laughs> everything's nice and pretty and fun until the dead fish show up. And their challenge is to use all of the tools that they have for measuring and discovering, these are scientific tools, to find out why those fish are dead. That's the game inside of this simulation. Welcome to Fold It. Here we are in competition puzzle 50, strep binding. So here's a completely different kind of game. Here is an actual protein folding game. Um, out of curiosity, how many folks have heard of Fold It or other protein folding games? So another breakthrough immersive education technology that basically says, we have a complicated situation on our hands. We don't have millions of dollars of lab equipment to put into every high school. In fact, we can't put protein folding technology into any high schools or middle schools. We can create a game about it, we can connect them all together, and they compete with each other by trying to fold proteins. The most efficiently fold prote folded proteins win. So what's the value in that for anybody? Well, proteins, protein folding, helps us to discover new medications and to create new drugs and more efficient drugs. So it actually helps humanity at large. Here we have someone describing a student who's playing it just describing what she's doing. It's, it's a little bit complicated if you're not into protein folding, but the important thing to note is she's competing, playing against other kids and other adults, actual scientists in folding protein. So it's a game. The game has real implications. There are high school students, so 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kids who are folding proteins more efficiently and better than research scientists. It's, it's been happening as a result of a game like this, which is incredible without a, a dollar of money spent on lab equipment. This protein is from a bacteria that causes strep throat. I'm Kathleen and it looks like I'm currently rank 84, which means I have a long way to go to get to the top. I'm competing against all these other players to fold this protein the best and get the highest score I possibly can. Now let's take a look at the protein. Note that I can rotate, translate, and zoom the camera. This thick strand that bends all around is called the backbone. Notice it's made up of helices, which are these curly spirals, and these flat sheets. When the flat sheets get close, they form hydrogen bonds. I'll talk more about hydrogen bonds later. These dangly things coming off of the backbone are called side chains. They can move into a discrete number of positions based on their molecular structure, so don't be surprised when they don't move exactly where you want them to. Now let's take a look at our tools. We were just talking about side chains, so let's look at this shake side chains tool. What it does is fixes all of the side chains at once, basically finds a good configuration for all of them such that these clashes are resolved. Okay, we'll pause it there and we'll move on to some other examples. This is one of my favorite because this is a thing that was missing when I was in school. But when was the last time that you saw groups of students excited about math? Uh, I would make the recommendation that if there are other large uh, school districts who are interested in sort of coming on board and providing a 21st century environment for 21st century students, that they should do, they should do this as well. That was from the New York City Department of Education talking about this math program where you're doing algebra but you're playing a video game as a result. So in order to, to play the video game you have to know algebra and they've formed competitions around this. All right, New York, you ready?
I hated algebra. <laughs> if I had something like this, it might have been a little different. Actually, I didn't hate algebra. I, I enjoyed it. But I was one of the few people in my school who enjoyed going through mathematics. A tool like this, when it's not sit, memorize, learn, make proofs, but it's compete against your friends, explore, create, com explode, and do head-to-head -head competition. It changes the way you learn. And your feelings about algebra change. So if you didn't like algebra like I did, you might not actually have a chance to do well in algebra because you're disengaged. However, if you don't even think about it, you just know algebra, but you're a great video game player as a result, that can change your life because now you inherently understand algebra, not because you had to study it in a formal way. It was a side effect of doing something exciting, playing a game. Hello, this is William with Minecraft. Ooh, wait a second. Okay, so we're going to move on. All these that I've shown you so far have been specifically immersive education technologies. They're built for education. They're constructed with education in mind. Here's a completely different, what we call stealth learning. This is using the game Minecraft. So uh, when I'd asked how many people played Minecraft and Uva, a number of you raised your hands. I'll give a quick summary, and then we'll see what's going on here. Minecraft is a video game that is very, very simple to play. You walk around with your character and you destroy or crush blocks. The blocks pop up and then you gather the resources that they expose. So for example, I might crush a block of dirt and inside that dirt might be some iron or some gold and I take that into my inventory. Then I can craft. So I mine. You have picks and other equipment to mine the dirt, mine the environment, and then I craft. I collect all these resources and I craft them. It's a builder-based game. You construct things with it. The things you construct are up to your imagination. Now most people play Minecraft simply by playing and they're having a lot of fun uh, and that's a great thing but there is something called stealth learning that we're spending a lot of time focused on which says take these commercial video games, take the stuff they're already having fun with, how can you apply some form of learning inside of there? Now this is a 30 minute video so I won't destroy you with this one, but I'll put it on fast forward so you can see what happens. The way to apply stealth learning in games is to find the learning possibilities inside of them and structure them in such a way that the player still is having fun playing but they're going through a series of steps or a curricula that has been developed that enhance certain things in that person, that learner. In this case, it's logic planning, resource management, combining things, memory and retention. All these things were happening as a result of Liam, who happens to be my son. He was my first experiment. Um, he's a great experiment. He's addicted to Minecraft, so I said at this point with our group, maybe we can find a way, because he, he was all into immersive education and that all the things that I was showing you so far until this came out, and that's all he wanted to play. So the notion here was, instead of just letting him play and have fun, we have specific goals. In this example, he has to make a torch. Now the average Minecraft player to survive has to light a torch and put it up so that they can at night see what they're doing and survive the night because all kinds of monsters come at you at night. The average Minecraft player will also just take an existing torch out of memory or out of their inventory and plunk them down. It's very simple, they're, they're just in your inventory. The stealth learning exercise here was you have no torches, you have to build them yourself. What does that take? I thought we'd sit down for half an hour and he would show me how to make a torch. As it turned out, to make a torch is not as simple as it seems. You have to go cut down trees. From those trees, you have to turn the wood into sticks. From those sticks, you have to construct a pick. Then you have to take that pick, go mine the coal, then you have to gather the coal, and then you have to combine all these things into a torch. It's about five hours later, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, this is too stealth. And he had a great time, but the things that he had to go through were immense. There's a lot of deep thinking and organization. There were a couple of other steps as well. So I'll, I'll walk through this, I'll let him walk you through some of it to see the basics, and I'll fast forward it. Better. Okay, so last time, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but you know how to make a chest. So now, let's, I lost all my stuff in the last few <laughs> videos. So, except for this. 14 things of wood and 4 sticks. So, let's say, stick is just two wood on top of each other. It, it could be anywhere in the... 
So what he's doing is he's crafting now. He's got the wood. He's taking it from his inventory. He's putting it into a crafting environment. And the way that those things are combined together is like a recipe. Depending on how you combine them, you get different things. And he's showing how to create those sticks. That's the first step in making a torch. Middle, up higher. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Just have to be, but you can't like do this. And here comes a dog that's really hungry. So suddenly there's a challenge. He's now got to survive this dog that's hungry, and he's got to make this, as you can see, it's, now it's dark outside. He has to get this torch up very quick, so he's motivated. Oh, great. Dog outside. You can't do that. It just has to be two sticks by yeah, themselves? Yeah, two sticks by themselves, doesn't matter where. And what does that make for you? Two pieces of wood by themselves or two sticks? Two sticks by themselves makes absolutely nothing, but I'll just make a sword. Oh, make a pick up. So he just made, he's hearing this dog barking, so he had a task to do, but now he heard this dog, which may or may not be hungry and attack him, so he's created a sword to protect himself. So all this incidental, you know, like in real life, you've got these perfect plans and things don't go the way you want them to. Now you have to improvise, and with the resources you have, you have to continue on your original quest. So I'll go ahead and I'll play this, but I'll fast forward it quite a bit. Sword. And I'll turn it down. But you can start to see some of the things that are happening. It's getting nighttime. So this notion of stealth learning, I think, especially for the serious games and social connect uh, audience, is really one that immersive education is engaged quite a bit on, taking off-the-shelf Xbox games, off-the-shelf Nintendo Wii's, iPad games, things that kids of all ages, uh, even graduate students and adult learners, things that people are playing all the time, and build learning experiences inside of them. The Immersive Education Psychology Group, we have groups inside of Immersive Education, along with our K-12, that's our elementary primary school groups, are issuing a call for original research in serious games. And not specifically serious games, but stealth learning in serious games. What can you do with these off-the-shelf commercial games and how much, you know, what I've just told you is they teach you a lot, but can you prove that? So here's a project that we did with the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian has a museum, and they have what I would consider the same problem that every museum has. You can look, but don't touch. And what the Smithsonian's doing with immersive education is they're bringing their environments that they have behind glass to life. In this case, we have a virtual reality environment for a watershed where the indigenous people and the creatures that are in that would normally be behind glass. You'd walk kids through or adults through the museum, but don't let them touch. Here they're invited to actually touch, interact, and play. And this is being shown on what's called a corner cave. The notion of a cave where you're totally immersed is very appealing, but they're expensive. And not a lot of schools, especially schools that have challenges with resources, have the funds to make those. So our immersive education uh, full augmented mixed reality group constructed a corner cave using two screens and the screens can be synchronized for a wraparound effect or they can be broken into two completely separate uh, displays which is what you see here. Okay, tell me what you're looking at and what you're pointing at and what they use them for. The, the bird uses his talents to get his food. Good job, okay, thank you. Okay, is there anybody that knows what kind of a bird that is? Austin. A hawk? A hawk? No, it could be. Anybody else have some ideas? Tim? Falcon. Oh. Falcon? A falcon? Okay. Might be. Casey? An eagle? An eagle? All good ideas. These are the same kids that didn't have money to go on the bus trip to the zoo that was just a few blocks away. Now they're in a watershed in Maryland with a Smithsonian. Um. Okay, we've got it. All right. See the dog that's right behind me. And then later on, they were actually joined by Smithsonian researchers, people, and also have had NASA scientists from the state agency NASA come and visit them, people they'd never, ever have a chance to interact with in their entire lives. They're now coming into the school through immersive education technologies and sharing things with them. 
this does a couple of very important things. One is it, it actually engages the students and the kids more. But the other thing is it lights up in their brains, gosh, I met a NASA scientist. I met a Smithsonian researcher. Now they have these interactions, but they don't think of it as, you know, I was in a cave. They say, I met them, I know them. And it, it, it inspires a lot of them to want to do this in their real work. It inspires a lot of the students to want to follow these career paths because they have access. They're meeting the people who change the world around them and they want to change the world too. So here's an example of one of the research scientists. What we had, is, it's was filmed in the dark, so it's hard to see. This is the corner cave. On the left side, through telepresence, we have one of the Smithsonian researchers standing at a dock in Maryland, hundreds and hundreds, um, maybe a, almost a thousand miles away from the school, showing what the dock is like. Then you'll see a virtual environment appear where the students are actually exploring the same dock as well. So the real world is on the left. On the right is a simulation of the virtual, of the, of the Smithsonian's environment that the students are going through while they're in the cave. Uh, I'm going to bring in a very special um, guest, you might say, uh, because he's, he came out here, it's kind of cold, and we're going to bring him back up to the, um, the, the education building in just a couple of minutes. Before we do, I wanted to, to, to uh, show him to you, because you're going to be seeing um, uh, one of these um, terrapins um, later on in, the, in your virtual world. Yeah, I'm not be sure that you can see oh. this. Uh, <laughs> this is a Ma Maryland Diamondback Terrapin. You see him stretching? His name's Dinky. And Dinky has been living with us for a long time. How many years? Two years. Okay? But you can see, if you can, hopefully, the markings on, Dinky, on this Maryland Diamondback Terrapin. See him? Here's the shell here, I'm kind of holding them. Okay. So Dinky is going to get back into his nice warm uh, uh, container and be taken back to the building. But I wanted to bring him out and show him to you right now. Okay, so everybody say goodbye to Dinky. Bye. Bye, Dinky. All right. So that is one form. Here is another form. And, and, you know, we have a number of forms of immersive education, probably more then I can show up in one uh, setting. Here's an Im immersive dome as well where Krakow is being toured. And you step into a semi-dome, and there's a little trackball, and you can turn all around, and you step into the dome, and it completely envelops your senses, your visual sight and sound. So you can spin around and look all around. Ooh, you can get a little bit sick if you go too fast. All right. That's probably, I'd say, probably enough demos to give you a sense of what immersive education is about. It also includes, there's a lot of augmented and mixed reality technology I see at the conference here today, so you get some feels about that. We're using that as well uh, for different learning studies and subjects. And, you know, I'll go ahead and back out of these demonstrations because we've got plenty more. I'd be happy to talk about more of this with you offline as we have more time throughout the conference. But I'll stop this, come back to my slides. And a lot of this I've, I spoke about as we were walking through, that the actual hard work is done by our technology working groups. Technology working groups are chartered to produce things, standards, software, best practices. They work in cooperation with community groups, which have no mandates. They're spontaneously created in the immersive education community, and they may be teachers, for example, who want to talk about a certain technology. There are a number of new groups that have been launched, and just about everything that you can imagine in this space has a group dedicated to it, and members create their own groups as well. They can propose any type of a group. And one of the recent expansions of immersive education globally has been immersive education chapters. And you can see just earlier this year, a number of new chapters uh, were launched. And there's an Asian chapter under development as well that's not ready for launch, but I'd be happy to speak with you about that uh, as well. And chapters can have their own conferences, their own summits, but ultimately we, we come back to the Immersive Education Conference in Boston that is going international uh, as well with publications through the Journal of Immersive Education. 
And finally, I'll just leave you with my favorite, maybe my very favorite video clip of an immersive learning environment. Uh, and it comes back to, again, why. You know, why do you do this? And my fundamental belief, and I think almost all of our members are the same, if you can change the way people learn, you can change their lives. And so here's an example. And I'll, I'll end with this. Here's an example of one of our very first immersive education technologies. One of our members, Rich Green, took this technology, it was virtual world technology, and he converted it into something called OpenSim. And here's what he did with this. He took virtual world technology, he put it into a corner cave smart board environment and started using it to teach kids in pre-kindergarten. This is before they can actually even read or write how to use it. Thank you very much, folks. This has been my time. Thank you.